just to let you know, uh, Art Bell passed away yesterday. I don't know how many of you know who he is. Uh, yeah, he founded the largest radio audience uh, program uh, ever, Coast to Coast AM, uh, which ran from uh, like 11 p.m. till uh, 5 in the morning. Uh, actually brought it up to an audience of 10 million uh, listeners. Did you talk about UFOs a lot? Oh, yeah, UFOs. I mean, I mean, if you're addressing an audience that's up at 3 a.m., what do you talk about, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's all the stuff that goes creeps in the night. But, uh, the rap boys will creep, creep it. There you go. Don't forget about Bigfoot. Yeah. Bigfoot, yeah, I mean. Well, what was interesting about Art is he would actually have me on a show once in a while. Uh, typically, I would get on like once a year. And the last time I was on, I was on with Fuzz, and he had us on for four whole hours. Um, but towards that last hour, he ba basically said, now you guys are Christians, right? What is this gospel thing all about? <laughs> and so he gave us like 15 minutes really just to explain the gospel. And he said, that really sounds attractive. I mean, I don't know whether he ever gave his life to Christ or not, but the very fact that he gave us a clear opportunity to present the gospel to an audience of people who believe in UFOs and aliens <laughs> and uh, you know, conspiracy theories about how you know, the government's doing this and that. Well, the government does do a lot of things, so I can see why. So they called in and asked you questions? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the other thing Art would do. He would let me field calls from people calling in, literally from around the world. So... Uh, couldn't believe you got 10 million night owls that are up there listening to radio, but they do. Anyway, he passed away. George Nury has now taken over the program. He also has his on uh, probably about once a year. So, um, And George also gives us some good opportunities. Clearly, it's a program that's dominated by unbelievers. But I am grateful that we've had the opportunity to really clearly lay out the difference between Christianity and why Christianity provides a rational way to evaluate these claims and actually led to me doing a debate uh, with a very frequent guest that Art would bring on. Remember, he was a big UFO guy, a guy who believed that aliens had actually set up civilizations on the surface of Mars. So I wound up doing a major debate with him at the University of Wisconsin and uh, you know why we know for sure aliens haven't been here, <coughs> uh, haven't been to Mars or the other thing they always talk about is how the aliens helped the Egyptians build the pyramids. And uh, this gave me an interesting opportunity. People often think that people who lived thousands of years ago just weren't as smart as we are. Uh, they were incredible in what they were able to do. And so this idea that they needed the technology of aliens uh, to build pyramids, you know, it is true that these pyramids are designed to within a 15th the diameter of the moon in terms of the orientations. And basically people concluded that it had to be beyond the technology of people who didn't have telescopes. But what they don't realize is the degree to which the Egyptian government invested in astronomy. And they had this whole team of astronomers making accurate measurements, basically using transit instruments. They would set up a telescope that would be right on the north-south line, and they would literally time it uh, with their heartbeat uh, to high precision, and uh, <coughs> they were able to make measurements with that degree of accuracy. And they'd also say, well, there's no way you could build a pyramid of that size with that degree of accuracy. Well, if you've got 100,000 slaves working for, you know, 60, 70 years, and you've got all these astronomers that are giving you the measurements they need, it's no big deal. Uh, hard to imagine that we would ever hire 100,000 people to work for 60 years at 12 hours a day today. That just wouldn't happen. Or what I tell my astronomer friends, there was a time in the history of the Egyptian empire where 25% of the national income went for the support of astronomy. As an astronomer, I'm a little bit envious. <laughs> so today we're surviving on 0.0025%. So <laughs> yes.
between the crimes. And so it, it was a, truly a labor of love. It was kind of building thing. It was, and those stonemasons would work on a block for months. Yeah. I mean, you know, we get the idea, okay, we're going to build a stone building. Uh, you know, just get a saw, chop it up, put it up. But no, they would make the stones uh, so perfectly uh, rectangular that they could actually set the stones on top of one another without any kind of cement because of how smoothly that they... So, I mean, we just wouldn't spend that kind of labor today. I mean, it's just, it's unheard of. But back then, hey, we just captured all these slaves and we defeated this country. Let's put them all to work and... Uh, they also figured out something, too, that it really pays to feed your slaves. Mm -hmm. If you feed them well, they get to actually do more work. And uh, both the Egyptians and the Romans uh, were very good at making sure they got the greatest productivity out of the slaves, uh, give them good food, give them periods of rest. Uh, but there's a new paper that just got published making the point that uh, these stonemasons that go up to build these structures in the Egyptian empire uh, they figured out that they were dying of arthritis because they had to carry heavy stuff up these steep hills. And, uh, you know, if they're doing it all with uh, manpower, uh, if you're carrying like 100 pounds of stones uh, up a steep hill every day, uh, it does impact your knees after a while. So, a few of us can appreciate that, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> all right. Okay. When is Earth Day? Anybody know what Earth Day is? There's a date from 24th of April, I think. Okay. You know what? A major discovery happened this week. I think I'm going to save it for the Skeptics Forum because that would be closer to uh, Earth Day because it was all about something they discovered about the early Earth. Uh, Why did you have to tell us about it? Why did you have to tell us about it? <laughs> so, You'd be more motivated to bring skeptics and other people to the Skeptics Forum, right? Uh, next Sunday, I'll talk to you about this discovery. Uh, but it's all about how they found that the crust of the Earth transitioned uh, to a new kind of crust. Basically, magnesium iron crust tr transitioned to silica and had a major impact on whether or not life could survive long term on planet Earth. So. You ever visited a green sand beach? How many have ever seen a green sand beach? There's only a couple of them in the world. So, uh, but yeah, there was a time when all the sand on planet Earth was green. So, previous to three billion years ago. So, transitioning from green sand uh, to white and brown sand made all the difference about whether or not you could actually be here in class today. So, we'll talk about that next week with Skeptics Forum. If you know someone who's interested in that kind of stuff, uh, bring them along. Green sand is sought after for casting, isn't it? Uh, well, let me, I'll, I'll actually show you a little bit of this. Okay, here we go. Just a teaser. It's just a little teaser. Yeah, yeah that's a, that, those are little green pebbles. Uh, almost looks like jewelry. It's one in Hawaii. Yeah, th this is actually from that green sand beach in Hawaii. Yeah. The taboo one. Yeah. yeah, and uh, the reason why is that you know Hawaii is sitting on top of a hot plume, and so ancient crustal material is actually coming to the surface. So uh, yeah, you only get this kind of stuff if you got if you're sitting on top of a hot plume. So yeah, it's very near the, the southernmost point of the island of Hawaii is where you can see this. But you're telling me you can't visit anymore? Oh, you can. You're yeah. Not supposed to Oh, don't bring any home. No, this stuff is rare. You yeah, don't want to bury home. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, uh, compared to what we have today. Yeah. Okay. So, that's a uh, uh, present day crust, and this is what the ancient crust looked like. Anyway, we'll talk about that next time. Back to our talk on uh, the book of Isaiah. And uh, what we're doing, we collected all the passages relevant. Incidentally, if you don't have the questions, for a study on uh, Isaiah, we got questions here for you. We're still got some there too. Okay. Well, get these distributed for folks who don't have it. But hey, we've distributed, I think, last count, 350 of those. So we should have uh -huh. just just bring them to class. Well, I mean, that would appreciate it. And you got to memorize anyway. Okay. Are we on question one still? We're still on question one. And you know what? We're, 
Okay, we're going to spend a little bit of time in question one. Why? Because it's actually going to help us answer the other nine questions. But question one is all about what does the book of Isaiah got to say about the creation of the universe and God's role in creating the universe? And we began with this passage last week, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts, His glory fills the whole earth. And every part of God's creation reveals God's glory. And incidentally, that earth there is generic validity to everything. So no matter where you look, in the earth, in the universe, first life, the interior of the earth, uh, that green sand, no matter where you look, it reveals the glory of God in preparing the earth uh, for us human beings. And then moving into Isaiah uh, chapter 14, verse 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, this is where we ended up last week, the Lord of hosts has sworn as I have purpose. So will be as I have planned it, so it will happen. And we're talking at the end of last week how what this passage is telling us about creation is that God creates in a way where there's no accidents, no random outcomes. Every outcome and event has a purpose. Now, what was really interesting is when the class ended, somebody came up and said, well, what do you do about quantum mechanics? What do you do about statistical mechanics? I mean, those are accidental random outcomes, and yet you're saying, with God, there are no accidents and no random outcomes. We had a really interesting dialogue on that that I'll share with you right now. Even the randomness and the accidental outcomes of quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics must be exactly the way they are in order for us human beings to be here today. So even what looks random to us, uh, is not random at all. It actually has to be fine-tuned. Now, having said that, God knows, <coughs> we don't know. Like with quantum mechanics, for example, there's what they call the Heisenberg uncertainty, which means if you choose to measure the energy of a quantum particle, you're not going to know its position uh, to very high precision. That's the uncertainty. Or if you choose to measure the position, you're not going to know the energy level of a particle to very high precision. And say, what kind of precision we're talking about? If you measure the uh, energy of, say, a proton or an electron to reasonably high precision, the uncertainty in the position of that particle is roughly plus or minus half a mile. So you know, that's a pretty major uncertainty, right? We're talking about a little tiny particle, and yet the uncertainty is plus or minus half a mile. That's exactly where it is. However, here's the uh, importance of that uncertainty. If you make that uncertainty, say, plus or minus a quarter of a mile, or plus or minus uh, three quarters of a mile, suddenly there's a whole lot of proteins in your body that will fail to function and you'll die. Because in your body are lots of proteins that act like transistors. And the way the transistors function, they take advantage of that quantum uncertainty. Uh, to probabilistically get a certain amount of uh, energy uh, jumping the quantum barrier. And uh, you know how much jumps basically depends on that quantum uncertainty. So thank God that God exactly made the uncertainty what it needs to be so that we can have these transistors in our body doing what they need to do so that we can live. And incidentally, every animal life form, even uh, all the vascular plants, have those proteins that are crucial for them to be able to function and to live. So if it wasn't for that quantum uncertainty being exactly the way it is, you couldn't have a planet with plants and animals uh, thriving. It just wouldn't happen. And even some of the bacteria uh, wouldn't function without that. <coughs> Likewise with the statistical mechanics. Um, and you say, what on earth are you talking about? Uh, you know, it was interesting. The first time I taught this class 43 years ago, I thought everybody in the class knew everything about statistical mechanics. And <laughs> those people came up to me afterwards and said, uh, you know, maybe everybody hears about this in Canada in uh, <laughs> junior high and high school. But that doesn't happen here in the United States. So I quickly became aware that the education I had in Canada isn't the same as what happens here in the California. So all those other parts of the country that do, do quite well. But statistical mechanics, for example, uh, there are machines inside the cells. In fact, every cell has machinery within it 
that basically takes advantage of what's called Brownian motion. And Brownian motion is simply the fact that the molecules here in this room randomly bump into one another. So it's just kind of a chaotic motion of molecules. And uh, there are machines inside the cell that take advantage of that in the sense that these random Brownian motions uh, will cause a ratchet-like device to move forward, but the ratchet prevents it from going back. And so the Brownian movement actually causes the ratchet to move. And you actually have to fine-tune the chaotic motion of molecules inside the cell for the ratchet to work the way it needs to work in order for all of us to live. So you go home and have your lunch uh, today, you might want to thank God for the randomness of statistical mechanics and the uncertainty of quantum mechanics, because otherwise that lunch would have no benefit for you, and you, you, you wouldn't even be alive to enjoy your lunch. So uh, think about that. Explain that to your children and your grandchildren, and uh, they'll, they'll be thrilled. Okay. So They'll be thrilled another reason. If it wasn't for statistical mechanics, we would all have a problem in this room, because of that Brownian motion, that statistical mechanical motion of molecules in this room, for all breathing in air, that's the same temperature. And uh, you know, if it wasn't for the statistical mechanics, we could have uh, this lady over here breathing in air that's below the freezing point of water, uh, whereas this gentleman over here would be breathing in air that's above the boiling point of water. And we'd have number of numbers of you just dying on the. I mean, I wouldn't get through the class uh, before half the class would be dead. So uh, I'd probably, probably be one of them. So uh, thank God for the randomness that exists. And so, but the whole point is, and this passage is making it clear, even that is planned and designed by our God. The randomness is fine tuned. But again, people that ever asked me last week, too, okay, I can understand where we can't see. Uh, the certainty of where that particle is, but what about God? God's not limited by quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics. He knows what's going on, but it's crucial as beings in this physical universe that we not know what's going on. So, as a physicist, I can't measure the position of a quantum particle uh, to anything greater than plus or minus half a mile if I choose to measure its energy level to high precision. And so what quantum mechanics tells us, we're more ignorant than we thought we were before <laughs> quantum mechanics was discovered. Likewise, statistical mechanics. But you know that ignorance is crucial for us to be able to live here. So you can thank God for the way God made us ignorant about certain things. <laughs> All that from this one passage, right? Okay. <laughs> Moving on to Isaiah uh, 14, uh, 27. The Lord of hosts himself has planned it. Therefore, who can stand in its way? It is his hand that is outstretched, so who can turn it back? Okay, we haven't got to this one yet, so I, what I'm wanting to do, I want to get a comment from this side of the class, and a comment from this side of the class, and I'm going to reverse it. Because I remember last time, the comments were all coming from one side of the class, and I can't forget which side of the class it is, so I'm not... This was this one. Was this side? This side was the class that was doing really well? Okay, all right, got it. <laughs> but now you got Doug on this side of the class. Okay. All right, we'll start with this side of the class. All right. Maybe we can get you switching back and forth. That might be interesting. But yeah, okay. Based on this text, what do we learn here about the creation of the universe and how God created the universe? What's the basic claim here that's being made? And that's a hint. It kind of fits in with the last two texts we looked at. Over here, yes. Uh, that verse means to me that uh, he's the supreme authority. I like the, uh, the highest authority. So whenever he says something, the problems, you, you cannot even question. Okay, he's the ultimate authority, but I think you're getting onto something else. He's not the ultimate authority, he's the only authority. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. It's like, how about this side of the class? Anything you want to add? Yeah. 
uh, I would say that uh, this seems to indicate that it's, imp it's literally impossible for anyone to stand in opposition to God's will in matters like this. And I would say that probably begs the question of why, and I would say it probably is transcendent nature that literally the, his, his superior dimensionality and, and power just makes it where nobody constrained here can possibly stand up and oppose what he has planned in, in this domain. Yeah, do you think we ever try to actually do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I read this text, so just so you know, well, I mean, it seems pretty clear that God's in control of everything. No one can overturn his plans. But, oh, I've met quite a few people that think they can. I mean, that's the amazing thing. There are actually human beings running around. And it's not just human beings. I think there's one other guy that we meet early in the Bible who thought that too. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Um, no, the obvious thing to me about the way he created the universe is he stretched it out so it's expanding and it's irreversible. Is that two things? Or? Well, that, that's actually, we're coming to that. We're, yeah. uh, we got a passage coming up really quickly on that in Isaiah 40. Uh, but yeah, this text is making the point nothing stands in God's way. And if you think you can overturn God's plans, you're mistaken. Uh, yes? I have a question. Why does it say the Lord of hosts has helped the planet, therefore who can stand in its way? Why isn't it his way? Well, it, it, different translations will put different points there. The reason to put it there is the original is ambiguous, but most translations will say his way. And that certainly fits what's there. Power. Yeah. So I was thinking, uh, you know, it's he designed the universe, but not only designed it, but he designed the plan for how it evolves in a sense of how it proceeds, you know, from the beginning to the end. Yeah, that's a it, very good insight because a lot of people say, well, yeah, this is what God did, and <laughs> we can actually alter it. Right. And then it's so complete, he's already. So even when we alter it, it's part of God's plan. Yeah. So, you think of any passages of scripture that talk about that, how we humans step in and try to alter what God does? And God basically says, even that, I'm in control. Yeah. Wasn't there an incident in uh, the Exodus where God was going to punish the people of Israel for sin? And Moses in, uh, interceded with him and asked him not to do it, you know, because he is God and, you know, there's nations around him. Badly of him. And God did change his mind. I forgot about the details. Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, that's, Isaiah actually gets into that. It's not part of our study question or analysis we're doing. But, uh, you know, you see God, because it tells us, you know, God never changes. He's immutable. And yet you see passages where it claims that God relented, uh, God repented of what he did, <coughs> God changed his mind. Uh, how do you reconcile those texts with the texts that say God never changes his mind, nothing can alter God's plan, or this text that says nothing stands in God's way? That's a common question that uh, you know, skeptics throw up. We actually got that at a skeptics forum like three years ago. Well, so what's the answer? Well, ultimately God still was in control of it, even if it states he was going to do A and then Abraham intervened or Moses in this case intervened, but it still was still was a choice of God. And do you think God actually set Abraham up to do that very thing? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's a whole other great topic, isn't it? It, it is. <laughs> yeah. The language that's used there, I think, is what they call language of appearance. Yeah. From our, it's a language of perspective. From our perspective, it appears that God changes his mind. And he will use, and he will say that. He's not really changing his He's mind. He's not really changing his mind, but what he is doing is expressing his emotional commitment to what he has done. Because, you know, when people look at God and it says, well, God never changes, never alters, it's like they interpret that God has no feelings and no emotions. So these few texts we see where it talks about God repenting, relenting, God grieved over what he had done. Um, it talks about in the early chapters of Genesis that God grieved that he had created man because of the outcome. It's God basically expressing his feelings and his emotions, which is encouraging to us. 
you know, that God actually has um, an emotional relationship with all of us. And so, just like a parent grieves when they see their child going uh, the wrong way, likewise, uh, you know, God grieves when he sees us going the wrong way. And uh, so when your parents, uh, you know, your parents use the same language, right? Go ahead. Well, I think the, the language here is, from frame of reference, it's you know, just creation. So it's the trajectory of the whole creation can't be disturbed by less than God. Right. Um, so I don't know if it takes you all the way to Calvinism, you know, but if you only had this and no other, uh, no other texts, you could take Calvinism out of here, but that doesn't really always follow that everything down to every microsecond is planned and orchestrated by God. Well, I think you've got to go back, what was it, 40 years ago in this class where we actually took on the issue, how do you resolve human free will in divine predestination? Resolve. And, uh, yeah, we did it in nine months. I mean, and thanks to that nine month experience, I wound up writing a book on it, Beyond the Cosmos. I'm not going to repeat it. The book is over there. You can go check it out. <laughs> but the whole point is, God can still be utterly immutable and at the same time allow us to express free will where we think we're in control. But in fact, God is in control. And you've got texts, for example, where God refers to Pharaoh and said, I raised him up to be an instrument where he would commit evil, but I would use his evil for a greater good. And you look at all the Egyptians that wound up joining uh, the Jewish uh, people group as a result of the actions of Pharaoh, and basically says, I even used the actions of the evil uh, to achieve my purpose. It's all under my control. And you got that passage in the Romans, or pardon me, uh, Proverbs 15. A king makes a decision, but God predetermined the decision ahead of time. Which gives me some comfort when I see our government doing things. I thought, wow, I mean, is that really the wisest decision? Well, sometimes God even uses the foolishness of decisions that our leaders make to achieve his ultimate purpose and ends. Which is why we're called to pray for our leaders and not, not get discouraged. Okay. Uh, anything else before we jump to the next text? Yes, Steve. It's a really a blessing to me that God in his omnipotence is so kind in that to Israel he gave blessings and cursings stepwise, letting them know as a witness beforehand what would happen and as it happened, what would happen next if it happened. He did that with Pharaoh. Uh, that's really nice of him. Yeah, yeah he even <laughs> treated Pharaoh with a degree of kindness. That's an interesting point. Which gives us an example of how we're to treat evil people that come across our path and do evil to us. We're to follow that same example. Even be kind and realize God's in control of their actions. Yes, yes, go ahead. <laughs> he has a question. Okay, okay. I, I see it relating to the big laws of, of physics. Yes. Uh, immutable, unchangeable, unless God chooses to overcall them. And, and despite Hollywood and Star Wars and Star Trek, you know, breaking the laws of physics constantly, but that's sort of what I see. Okay, yeah, good. The laws of physics are something we can trust. And, you know, I kind of look at this as a scientist and say, okay, if this is really true, I can trust everything I'm seeing in the record of nature. God's not going to mess with me there. Uh, whatever is revealed, I know that's something I can trust. So, and you had a question? No, I was no. just directing. They're just directing a question, okay. <laughs> but we had one over here. When I, when I was in a small group once with a, a girl that had been uh, grown up in, in the Jewish world. Uh, she, uh, we were talking about punishment for some reason, and she said, and somebody asked her how that happened in her household that was Jewish, and she said it was, they would always say, remember, <coughs> remember? So, uh, I don't know. Well, I think kind of what you were saying, Steve, is, you know, if you see here in the book of Isaiah and in Jeremiah as well, God basically tells the Jewish people, because of what you've done, there's going to be consequences. They're not going to be pleasant. He kind of lays them all out. But every time uh, God does that through <coughs> Isaiah and Jeremiah, he says, and you'll be blessed at the outcome. I'm going to bring you back to the land. I'm going to bless you. But yeah, for 70 years, uh, this is what's going to happen to you. And uh, you will come back. So there was always a promise 
uh, of redemption coming through there. Okay, nothing stands in the way of God's purposes and plans. We can count on everything God has revealed to us to reveal truth and nothing but truth. Isaiah 37, 16. The Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of earth, you made the heavens and the earth. What is this saying about the creation of the universe? And what is this saying about God's role in uh, creating the universe? Got a couple of sentences here, so I'm going to start with this start of the class. Yeah, go ahead. He's higher than all creation. Higher than all creation. Enthroned. Enthroned. Okay. He's above everything. So, basically making the point, the cherubim, they're not part of this. Only God is. Because yeah, keep in mind, the, the nations around Israel at that time thought that the angels were the creators. And what he's saying here, yeah, the cherubim, which are the highest of the angels, he says, no, uh, God's enthroned above them. They're not part of this. God's the one that did it all. Anything yeah. else on this side of the class? Okay, over here. Jesus couldn't have been an angel because, uh, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses would say that. But, uh. Okay. Uh, yeah, but you got this phrase, the angel of the Lord. And uh, when you see that in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, he is worshipped as if he is God himself. So why is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, referred to as the angel of the Lord? Any clue? More figurative, not literal. More figurative, not literal, yeah. Go ahead. Well, because he's the one that came down and was actually there doing it. He was the one that came down and actually was there doing it, yes? Angel of means messenger. messenger. Means messenger, <laughs> yes. Also maybe his function, that what do we call it, Christophany, or was he incarnated maybe as an angel, or, or was only perceived to be an angel only? Okay, because, you know, angels have a power to appear to us in physical form. They're not constrained in physical form like we are, but they have the power to come and reveal themselves in physical form. And there, you'll see instances in the Old Testament where the angel of the Lord actually ate physical food. I mean, Moses, for example, fed the angel of the Lord. And uh, Moses referred to him as being God. So he treated him as God. And what do we see in the book of Colossians? How the fullness of the deity dwells in the second person of the Trinity in physical form. So the Holy Spirit is spiritual. The Father is spiritual, but the Son, he's the one who has the capacity to manifest himself bodily. So, given that angels have that capacity, that's why he takes the title, the angel of the Lord. But yeah, he's above the angels. And if you want to see, that this was a big uh, problem uh, for Jews at the time of the first century church, and that's why you've got the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was written uh, for the Jews. And notice how the book of Hebrews starts off. Chapter 1 of Hebrews contrasts the angels with Jesus Christ. And says, yes, he is the angel of the Lord, but he is at a level beyond all of them. He's the only one who's eternal. The angels were created. And then Paul's one that reminds us, there will come a time when we followers of Jesus Christ uh, will become uh, rulers and educators of the angels. So... The angels are not at the same stature of the creator. They're not involved in creation. Satan thought he could create, uh, but he couldn't. So that's why I'm not a gap theorist. The gap theorists basically say uh, Jesus uh, created, and he let Satan have a go at it. Satan messed it all up, and God fixed it all up again. That's kind of a gap. Uh, but the problem with that theology is that Satan does not have the power to create. And these are passages in Isaiah that tell us. God alone is the creator. The angels don't have that kind of power or capacity. It rests in God alone. And this is actually a message of the Jews with reference to all the nations around them. Their gods can't do this. Only the God of the Bible is capable of creating. And it's something that you'll see in the book of Isaiah repeated over and over again. Is that these other gods, they can't do it. Only God himself. 
There is no other agency of creation. There is no other factor. Sometimes people will say that today, for example, uh, gravity created the universe. Well, gravity can't create anything. Just like the angels can't create anything, gravity can't create anything either. There is no other factor in creation but the God of the Bible. It's like your brain can't create consciousness, <coughs> either, right? Yeah. Yeah, kind of like that. But you know, that's very popular amongst my peers who are not Christians, astronomers and physicists, saying, well, what brought this universe into existence uh, was some unknown law of physics, or some unknown feature of gravity, or some unknown feature of space and time. Well, this is a text that tells us no, that doesn't work. There is no other factor. Uh, God alone is the agency. Yes? <coughs> Would they assert that gravity or these laws are self existent? Well, that's what Hawking was saying before he passed away, is that gravity predated the universe. And that gravity brought the universe into existence. Uh, but you know, the laws of physics are basically describing features of the universe. They don't have creative power. So, and maybe people have watched too many Star Wars movies. <laughs> so. They also would, would imply that, that those things are self-existent. Yeah. Which is a very Well, I kind of look at the laws of physics like mathematics. They describe what God has created and set up. They're descriptive. Uh, mathematics doesn't have creative power. The laws of physics don't have creative power. But the fact that math actually tells you how physics works is remarkable. In fact, my colleague, uh, Ken Samples, he is a talk where he basically makes that very point. The fact that mathematics so elegantly describes the physics of the universe uh, both at its beginning and all the way through tells us there's got to be a God. Uh, otherwise, why does math work? Why does physics work? And you know, when I talk to my peers who are not believers, they say, you know, science works. But they need to ask the other question, why does science work? It's true, science works. And you know, it was uh, the concept that science works actually came out of the Christian faith. It's the Christian faith that gave birth to the scientific revolution based on the Christian principle, science does work. Competing things before the scientific revolution, you had a competing religion, especially in the East, who basically thought science only works some of the time. But basically, science works all the time. It always works. Therefore, we can trust it. Okay. Isaiah 40, verse 5. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Uh, what is this? I mean, did anybody ever hear this being sung sometime at Christmas? Handel's Messiah. Yeah, it's yeah. Handel's Messiah, right? Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you can sing it for us, all right. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the favorite parts of uh, Handel's Messiah. That's great. So, you know, it's wonderful about Handel's Messiah was the people going through the entire Bible saying, let's pick up the verses that we see throughout the Bible that really communicates uh, through uh, this kind of music, uh, the basic fundamentals of gospel. And this is one of the texts they picked up. The glory of the Lord will be revealed. All mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So, let's start with this side of the class. Any comments on this text? Have you ever sung Handel's Messiah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that specifically re speaking of uh, revealing nature? Or? Well, I think this is why it was put in the Messiah uh, musical. Is the fact that you know the whole thing about the Messiah communicating the gospel, and basically this is the one text they picked that made the point. Everybody has seen it. Everybody has heard it. Everybody has seen it and heard it because that's the way God created and designed the universe. So this is making a point. Yes, God created the universe, but he created the universe in such a way that it would declare to all mankind that God's glory is revealed through creation. Therefore, no one is without excuse. We've all seen the evidence that God is behind it. His glory is there. Uh, he has spoken it into existence, yes. I was going to say, to me it sounds like Psalm 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds like Psalm 19. Everybody has seen this. The glory of God 
in creation is evident to all. All have heard, all are without excuse. And you know, again, I think that's why I got put into that musical, making a point. Hey, this is something that's universal to everybody. You yes, know, it's in scripture. When we say that in high school, I would get like goosebumps on or you know. And I wasn't even a Christian then. <laughs> just the words of it just got to me so much. And it, the handle was not inspired like the Bible's inspired. But man, what a wonderful work that is. Well, I also appreciate that in Handel you've got uh, you know, Job 19, uh, where it actually talks about how Job uh, saw God and the gospel message in creation. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that was all done on purpose to make it clear, hey, this isn't just for those who have Bibles in front of them, uh, part of the Christian community. This is something that's communicated to all. What it tells me as a scientist is that when I look at nature, the component of nature, I will see the revelation of God in everything I study. And that's something I do and I challenge my uh, secular peers to say, I don't care what discipline of science you're in, look for the glory of God being revealed in what you're studying. You'll see design there. So that's something I hope to communicate as we launch into our Skeptics Forum next, next week about what happened to the continent. It's like, you know, every paper gets published. If you actually look at it uh, from a divine design perspective, you're going to see something really glorious and exciting. And yeah, it's thrilling to the heart to say, wow, even this plays a role. So and I remember talking to my wife, Kathy, and says, well, what about spiders? <laughs> so over our romantic dinner one night, I told her why she should be really grateful that there's spiders. <laughs> so, and at the end of it, she says, well, I still want you to take care of those black widows in the garage. So I said, well, that's fine. Don't they eat the mosquitoes she hates? <laughs> and they had violin spiders here in Sierra Madre, didn't they? Those are worse. Uh, they're even worse than the black widows, and I've had to kill a few of those. Yeah, they've actually been inside our house. So, yeah. But you know, they're part of God's glory. Can you think of how bad things would be if there weren't violin spiders around? That, that's what the question Kathy asked me over this romantic dinner, okay? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Our dinners are different from most of <laughs> In fact, I remember this waitress coming by and she says, I, 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 she, she was just totally plumbing, so what was going on? <laughs> Who do you think she was actually spinning the web to get you? <laughs> there you go. Thank you. All right. This side of the class, what do you got to contribute here? Yeah. Well, uh, the book of John starts out with the, that uh, the word that God spoke the word, and the word was God, and and through it everything was made. And, and uh, I, I had the feeling that the mouth of the Lord is very important. The mouth of the Lord is very important. I mean, part of our Christian theology is that God spoke the universe into existence. That's how powerful He is. He's able to speak it into existence with all the design features, all the glory embedded in it. So literally every component of it reveals him. Gentlemen in the back, yeah. Uh, today there's a lot of people that are uh, atheists. They will say there is no God. But this scripture says that all men are tied together. So eventually God will reveal himself. Yeah, all mankind together will see it. They still have to look. So. Yeah, I think that's why we're seeing a rise in atheism today. You've got an increasing percentage of our population that simply doesn't look at what God has revealed in nature. We need to look. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been wondering for a few minutes whether when it says all mankind together will see it, whether that's the second coming or other revelations like big changes in the sun and moon and maybe a comet, maybe an asteroid hitting, but to word together to me now indicates yeah, my take is I would include that, but I think the text is actually saying all mankind together in all contexts see the glory that God revealed. Yeah. It's everywhere. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've had people in this class saying, hey, you keep saying God is responsible for all this. I can't see it. We need to help people actually look, okay? And so it's a matter of training people, okay, when you're actually studying a component of nature, Look for the glory of God revealed. Look for the amazing designs in that beetle you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's remarkable. 
I mean, I just wrote a blog a couple of weeks ago making a point. We now know there's over 500,000 distinct species of beetles. The amazing thing is, is how each of them is designed in a different way to reveal the glory of God. And the thing about beetles is the amazing distribution of colors, the amazing distribution of structures. It really is awesome. Even bull weevils of many subspecies. Yeah. So, yeah. So, when you go home today, thank God for the beetles. Yeah. And not the musical kind. So, go ahead. What strikes me is that there's no alternative. No alternative. The, the, the universe exists. Describe to me an ultimate alternative. Hey, very good point. There is no alternate model other than God created and designed the universe for our specific benefit. And again, that's something that's been debated amongst our peers, basically saying, yeah, God created the universe for life. No, he created it explicitly uh, for us human beings. All the life we see here on planet Earth is to make possible our existence, our thriving, our capacity to hear and respond to the gospel, including those half million species of beetles. It's all there uh, to help us. So it means when we look at creation, look for that. Look for how God used this tiny point. In fact, we got a passage that speaks about this. I think it's coming right, right up. Here we go. Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or marked off the heavens with the span of his hand? Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure? So, yeah, we've been making the point. Every component. What is this telling us? Start with this side of the class and we'll go over here. <coughs> anyway. Well, everybody knew looking at the night sky they couldn't possibly count all the stars. But the one who created them must be able to. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the witnesses you get by not living in the city it is this amazing canopy over you. you you can't even count it all so how it came into being has to be from a source that you can't measure but the source you can you know what's sad today none of us are able to see with our naked eye the stars that Abraham was able to see no matter where you go on planet earth there's light and you know uh, air pollution that blocks our capacity to see the stars as Abraham could see them. So, you know, when God said to Abraham, can you count all the stars you see up there? You tell someone in Shanghai, can you count all the stars you see up there? Well, yeah. Let's see. <laughs> uh, I don't think I can count any. <laughs> or you're here in Los Angeles, maybe 30 stars, but you're in downtown L.A., uh, but Abraham could see more than 15,000 stars. In Death Valley, you can see a lot. You can see a lot, yeah. There are places in the United States where you can still see six to seven, eight thousand 8,000 stars. But still not like what Abraham was able to see. So, but now we've got telescopes that show us, hey, we're not just talking 15,000 plus stars. What about Northwest Territories, like the Great Slave Lake? That's pretty quiet. North Korea. Yeah. <laughs> or North Korea. <laughs> it's dark there. The problem is, even in places that are really dark, you still got air pollution. I mean, it's there. So, But yeah, it was about a decade ago they started founding what they called dark sky parks. So uh, there's a park in southern Utah that they basically make sure no lights uh, for 40 miles around. That could be a part of space tourism in the future. Well, actually, this park has become a tourist uh, destination. It's a place you can come with your telescope or binoculars and see a sky that's really dark. But I meant like with Branson's uh, and um, what's his name, you know, Tesla's guy, you know, his space tourism. You'll, you'll see the sky like you never saw before. <coughs> well, I've talked to astronauts who have been up there, and they said, yeah, what you see uh, at the space station is something way beyond what you can see here on the Earth. And yeah, there's actually been plans, maybe we can put telescopes in the back side of the moon where the light of the Earth never impacts. So uh, there's actually some serious talk about doing that. Uh, but hey, they found this wonderful site in uh, Antarctica uh, that's 
isolated by more than a thousand miles from the nearest light. And uh, it's 14,000 feet high. And the temperature never changes day or night, summer or winter. That's what's really got them excited. It's the only place on the Earth where the temperature <coughs> never changes. And that's important for astronomy because changing temperature actually changes the figure of our mirror. So this is a place where the figure of your mirror will never change. But guess what that temperature is? <laughs> minus 95 centigrade. <laughs> or minus 5 Fahrenheit, pardon me. But yeah, it's a place where the temperature variation is 2 degrees Fahrenheit, day and night, summer and winter. That's all it changes. So, and there's no wind. No wind, high altitude. I mean, it's ideal for a strong. Besides the backside of the moon. But this is a lot cheaper to go to. Yeah. What about Joshua Tree? I, that's oh, that's I and another guy were talking about it. We've been there and we see a lot more stars. Than yeah. that. You will in Joshua Tree, but I had been there. You still see light pollution. Yeah. Yeah, it's not really so dark. Like what percentage does that block out? How much better would it be in the perfect place? Okay. You know what's amazing about living here in the Los Angeles basin? 40 minute drive from here. You can be in a spot where you can see with a naked eye the Milky Way. It's where we do our star parties. Because uh, there's a place 7,350 feet above sea level. Nice parking lot there. But as you look out at the night sky, you can see the Milky Way for with a naked it's eye. Ski season. For money, it's not <laughs> ski season. One reason we don't go during ski season because they turn on the lights. And that light basically ruins everything. But yeah, once, Mount once ski season's yeah. over, Mount Wilson no longer can you yeah, see the Milky Way. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, in fact, you know, what the reason why they put those telescopes in Mount Wilson, they took advantage of LA smog, and LA smog blocked out the lights of the city, and also made for very laminar air. Uh, that Mount Wilson Observatory had some of the best seeing in the world. In the old days, right? In the old days. Yeah. But the problem is they cleaned up the pollution, oh. and now the night sky is no longer... I mean, they've got lights there, and the, oh, the seeing is no longer a half an arc second. Uh, it's worse than a second arc. So that's why they've turned over those uh, Mount Wilson telescopes to amateurs. Where Hubble was? Hubble yeah. Was there? Hubble did his research. It was at Mount Wilson, uh, where the first measurements were produced that proved that we live in a continuously expanding universe. Happened right up there. Because uh, for a long time, that was the world's largest telescope. It was in a dark site where the seeing was excellent. But hey, we cleaned up the smog and ruined everything. So, for Mount Wilson, it's good for us down here in the valley. When's so. the next star party? When's the next star party? Uh, I think um, Ross Hoagland's uh, working yeah. on that. So, but yeah, we have to wait till... Uh, the earliest we could do it is in May, because uh, that's because right now they still got the lights on for the uh, ski resort. So, and besides, people don't like going up there in the winter time anyway. It's too cold. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can I ask you a question that's a little bit off topic? But you're talking about the measure of the universe. So this passage is implying the universe is very large. So the question I ask you, going to ask you, is about the light travel time. Um, recently, I heard one of your discussion and debate with uh, Dr. Jason Lyle, mm -hmm. and you raised this uh, anisotropic synchrony convention. Yes. That according to Einstein, if you use distance and clock, you can't alone, you can't measure light in one direction, <coughs> right? Basically, that's what I understand he's trying to say, so that you're free to speculate yeah. a light coming from distant stars, uh, the velocity of that infinite velocity, whereas outgoing, I mean, light outgoing from Earth could be the same as yeah, light, and then when you take a round trip, it's going to still be the, the velocity of light, right? To average it out. So, he says, therefore, you know, God could have created the universe, and just put the stars there, and the light would have instantaneously come to us. We don't need to worry about light travel time as, as a measure of the distance of the universe. <coughs> However, I was thinking... I mean, even the high school of physics tells us if you use uh, consider light as a wave or a particle, couldn't you measure um, the speed of light in any direction you want? Because if you, you know, the basic idea is, you know, a wave, you, you measure the speed of a wave 
by counting the frequency and the wavelength, right? You multiply the two and you get the speed. So well, you, could, you could measure... Jason Lyle is correct. Uh, when we measure the velocity of light, we're always measuring the return path. And so, yeah, he thought, well, as a younger creationist, maybe we'll just say that the velocity of light going away from us is half of 300,000 kilometers per second. And when it comes towards us, it's infinite. So that distant light can get here immediately. And so you can have galaxies billions of light years away where the light gets to us immediately. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is... Well, okay, here, let me, let me oh. complete this, okay. The reason why his um, uh, speculation fails is that we have to, for his model to work, it's got to be at an infinite velocity coming to us from all directions, not just one direction. So, I mean, he is right, is that we only can measure the return path of the velocity of light, which would be okay for talking one direction only, but he wants to make it work for all directions. Why do we have that convention coming opposite to us and towards us at all these different velocities? Now, uh, you could actually appeal uh, to general relativity, but the problem is this. If you got the velocity of light coming at you at an infinite velocity from all different directions, general relativity tells you that's equivalent to having a second gravitational field. And we don't measure a second gravitational field. There is no gravitational field. And the very latest, this didn't make it into my book, you'll see two pages in a matter of days where I use diagrams to refute uh, Jason Lyle's speculation. But there's a new observation that actually shows us, okay, you're right, we can only measure the return path of the velocity of light. However, there's a supernova exploding in a galaxy that's gravitationally lensed, but it's gravitationally lensed by different components in the galaxy cluster that's causing the gravitational lensing. And we're actually seeing is this supernova erupt again and again over several years. Why? Because the eruption of the supernova, uh, because of the complexity of the gravitational lens, will take a different angle in reaching us as it does at different components. So you're actually putting to a test his hypothesis. Okay, if we change the direction, does it make a difference? And it makes no difference at all, which really means the velocity of light is 300,000 kilometers per second as it travels in all directions. Because this is the one example where we get to measure the velocity of light taking different pathways to reach us from a single supernova eruption. And there's actually been three papers published in the astronomical literature where they've been able to see it. Now, a supernova eruption takes about seven months to go from start to finish. What was fascinating about this particular supernova, uh, we saw it about four years ago, we saw it again three years ago, and we saw it again about a year ago. And it's all because the light from that supernova traveled along different pathways uh, to reach our telescope. And so one pathway was a shorter pathway than the other, so it actually got here earlier than the other pathways. And they're actually predicting we're probably going to see two or three more uh, signals from this supernova because we expect that this gravitational lens is complex enough that we're going to get other pathways uh, reaching our telescopes as well. That's so with that, uh, his model is dead in the water. Yeah, but what, what I'm trying to say is um, why can't we measure velocity of light in any direction we choose if you go by uh, a wave, you know, the speed of a wave, just as I said, you know, all you need to do is be able to measure the frequency and the wavelength. You don't even need to know the distance or any clock. You just measure those two. You voila, you multiply the two, you get the velocity of light, or a good estimation of it. So let's say you, you send a, an Exheimer laser from here to the moon and have somebody up there, an astronaut, receive the light, and he can just, he doesn't even have to know anything. He just has to measure the wavelength and the frequency of that light that's incident to the moon, and he can just multiply that. Same thing as he sends the light to us, we can just measure the frequency, you know, using like well, a... Well, all this got discussed in the scientific literature, and uh, there were famous physicists that said, we really can measure the one-way velocity of light, uh, but the bottom line is, they were all mistaken. We don't have any instrumentation that can tell us what the one-way velocity of light is. We're always stuck having to measure a return yeah. path. But couldn't you just measure like the, uh, the wavelength coming, the light coming in? 
using like the friction grating that astronomers use, like themselves use all the time. Yeah, that, that's what people thought. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. Q, 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 Q well also obviously E equal MC square obviously yeah. would all fall apart if, if, if the speed of light changes. So, so the mere math also yeah, tells us yeah. that it has to be constant. If you have any variation in E equal to MC square, then, then the whole universe isn't going to work properly and everything we see wouldn't work properly. So the well, mathematics and the physics also say it, it can't change. Yeah, and because of this supernova uh, observation, a number of younger creation scientists have said, that's a bad argument. That doesn't work. And uh, recently, uh, I think it was Danny Faulkner came out and said, we younger creationists have, must recognize none of our models work. Well, that's a fair statement, uh, but you'll see a stronger statement that I make in a matter of days saying there's a fundamental uh, problem here. Uh, none of them will work. And it's that very point. If you want life in the universe, there is no possible young Earth model for the light travel time problem, other than the fact that God changed the laws of physics, but the Bible tells us God didn't change the laws of physics. Moreover, we can measure the velocity of light to high precision. Everywhere we look at galaxies and stars, in fact, uh, this came up in a discussion I had on Facebook about whether or not uh, we can actually measure something like the velocity of light with high precision at all different look-back times. The strongest spectral line we can see is what's called the hydrogen, neutral hydrogen line. The neutral hydrogen line is a hyperfine spectral line, which means it's a single line that splits into two because of the magnetic field. Well, the degree that by which it splits into two depends on the velocity of light. So by measuring the frequency of that neutral hydrogen line, uh, we can determine what the velocity of light was like uh, when that light left that galaxy or star. And because that line is so incredibly strong, we can see that line in galaxies as far away as 13 billion light years. Which means over 13 billion light years, no change in the velocity of light. Which basically verifies what the Bible told us. God set up the laws of physics. He made them fixed. As it says in Jeremiah 33, I am immutable. I never change. As proof I never change, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And recently we've been able to prove that the laws of physics don't change over the history of the universe to better than 16 places of decimal per year. So with very high precision, we know they don't change. No, no more questions, I'm sorry. Q, the time is also constant, always goes forward, can't be stopped, can't be reversed in this class. People seem to think class uh, time goes faster as we get near the end of the class. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we're at. Well, it seems like it goes so, faster so, so for me, too. So what you measure, so. what's apparent, and what you experience seem to be a little bit different, you know? You can always know when you feel compelled to speak. <laughs> OK. Well, we'll pick up the rest of these passages next time. And I think it's better and better as we go through. But here's what I want to conclude with here. Yeah, we've got a passage coming up which makes the point uh, that also stated in Psalm 147, how God knows the name of every single star. Yeah. And, uh, but this is making a point. God actually knows every speck of dust. That's why too. Yeah, every speck of dust is something that God knows and understands and is controlled for our existence. So when you go home for lunch today and you see a speck of dust on the table, thank God for that speck of dust. Even that tiny speck of dust has been purpose, determined, and measured by God. He has measured every single speck of dust. He knows where it is, and he's got a purpose for that speck of dust. However, uh, that does not give an excuse for your children to allow specks of dust to accumulate uh, in their rooms or on their desk. So yeah, you're able. I mean, I'm giving you permission to clean up those specks of dust. To keep in mind, your archaeologist the job. You know that. That's right. But literally, even the dust of the universe must be fine-tuned for all of us to exist. And there's a lot of dust in the universe. But every speck plays a role. Can you say is this really true? Yeah, they've actually been able to measure the fine-tuning of the bits and pieces of matter in the universe. It literally has to be fine-tuned to better than one part in a quadrillion, 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 quadrillion. And yeah, there's not that many specks of dust in the universe. So every little speck has been counted by God, measured by God. Every speck needs to be exactly the way it is 
in order for us to all be here in the class today. So thank God for dust. All right. <laughs> Father in heaven, we do thank you for dust. We thank you for everything that you created, everything that you designed. And Lord, help us to see as we look out at your creation, the way you designed it, the way you expressed your glory in a manner so that all that there is so we can exist and serve you. And show us, Lord, given the great value which you put in each one of us, what it is you want each one of us to do in order to bring you pleasure and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Have you ever experienced a gift gallop? <laughs>